Lord, thank you for James and his willing, willingness to share with us this morning. I would pray that you would bless him as a vessel of your word, um, and that we would be attentive, attentive as listeners to hear what he's saying and what you're saying. Through. Amen. Can you name the slides for me? What's that? Can you name the slides for me, or is there a clicker that works? Um, I can manage. I don't know how to see this one. Okay. Um, I've been gone for, I don't know, a month, over a month. Paige and I have been on our own 40 days of wandering. <laughs> <laughs> Testing. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I, I realized very quickly when we were planning the Exodus series, I just like had to opt out at the rotation. So you're going to get to hear me uh, tomorrow. So hopefully I won't get boring. Um, yeah, so I've been, I've been listening, tuning in from afar, sometimes from airplanes, um, listening to the recordings, watching the recordings of Exodus so far. Um, so hopefully I, you know, I'm, I'm up to speed. Um, this is what, at least what I'm choosing to uh, highlight of what's happening in the story so far. Um, we're going to talk about this encounter um, Moses has with Yahweh at the burning bush um, and his many excuses. Um, and, uh, but yet, yet Yahweh accommodates him and appoints Aaron. Um, there is this like preparing that uh, Kevin went into uh, graciously, not too much detail uh, uh, about Moses' son, you know, or Moses, or whatever. Um, and there's this uh, standard that Yahweh is, is like holding Moses to, or some sort of preparation for this task. And, and then um, Dorman talked uh, about, you know, Yahweh's second set of instructions to Moses. And uh, right here, right before, right at the end of four, you know, Moses and Aaron show themselves to the elders, and the elders were like, yeah, you know, we, we think you're good to go, you know, we like your magic tricks, uh, it seems like God's behind you, you know. so uh, I wanted to go, briefly go over the instructions that Yahweh has given to Moses, there's two separate sets um, this is a kind of long passage. I highlighted the you know instructions I'd like to highlight, but I'll read the whole thing. Um, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what you have done, uh, what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel listened to you, which they did. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say, And Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Yahweh our God. So that's what he's supposed to say. Um, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he'll let you go. Um, yeah, keep going. Uh, keep going. Okay. So, you, you see, I mean, the last one I just said, you know, that's what the result of his message will be that the king won't let him go unless Yahweh extends his hand and strikes them with wonders. I'm not sure how you strike someone with a wonder, but whatever. <laughs> um, so this is the end result. I will make the Egyptians fairly disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Wow, what a good, crazy ending. So that's what Yahweh you know, told Moses was going to happen. Uh, next one. So this is what Dorman talked about last week, I think. Uh, I got my least confused. So um, <clears throat> he says again, he's gonna, he, he describes to Moses what's going to happen. He says, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what Yahweh says Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, 
Let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Wow. What a crazy message to, for Moses to have to give Pharaoh. Um, let's see if he does it in Exodus 5. Um, I'm going to be reading the whole passage, but I'll be focusing at the beginning and a little bit at the end. Uh, and I'll be almost ignoring the story of these bricks without straw because I think it's more important to focus on our key players here. Um, hopefully it makes sense. That's why I asked you to have your Bibles because I'm going to just read, basically read the whole thing and then kind of reflect back on the passage. And I'm not going to just like flip back and forth for you. So maybe you can look and see. Um, okay. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now, let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Yahweh our God, or he may strike us with plagues over the sword. Okay, I'm going to assess uh, I'd like to, you to all join me in an assessment of what Moses said to Pharaoh. He's been given his instructions by Yahweh. Uh, go ahead and go. Next slide. Okay, so let my people go so they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. To me in the wilderness? Yep. Yeah. That's what Yahweh told Moses to say. The God of the Hebrews has met with us now. Let's take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Yep. Yeah. He also said that. Oh, or he may strike us with the plagues or with the sword. Uh-uh. <laughs> Yahweh did not say that. <laughs> um, and also, Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh, went to Pharaoh. If you flip back to Exodus 4 um, or Exodus 3, it says to go that they should go with the elders. So there is no indication that the elders went with them, which I mean, maybe they were there, but Maybe not. Based on this story, I I like to think lean towards that they that they weren't there. Maybe this would have gone a little bit differently if they were. So seems like <clears throat> Moses and Aaron kind of took this into their own hands. They're like, we're the ones with the magic tricks. We're gonna go before Pharaoh. Um, and it also seems like when Moses and Aaron got a negative response, they decided to kind of up the ante by adding in this. You know, if you don't let us go, then he's going to kill us. Um, go ahead and go to the next. So, yeah, I, I don't know. This is my speculation on why um, it's really hard to deliver bad news to people, <laughs> especially uh, people who are in power. Um, he was supposed to say, God will take your first point, Pharaoh. But instead he said, oh, God will kill us, the Israelites, if you don't let us go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Moses totally didn't say that. Maybe he wasn't supposed to say that on the first time. I don't know. But he definitely shouldn't have said God's going to kill us. He definitely misportrayed who Yahweh was. I think it's easy to try to manipulate someone, twist their arm. Um, it, it seems apparent to me that this was not the response Moses was expecting, even though Yahweh told him twice that Pharaoh was not going to respond well. Um, and then he kind of I, I, I mean, I think I fall into this too, you kind of analyze the person and see what they care about. And he knew that Pharaoh cared about his slave labor. So if he threatened Pharaoh that God was going to kill them, kill all his slaves, then, you know, take his slave labor away. You know, maybe. I'm going to go to the next slide. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to just look at Pharaoh's response, right? Who is Yahweh that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh. So I won't let Israel go. It's an interesting response. Um, I'll get into this later, but you know, Pharaoh was in, was in charge of the, the Egyptian worship, so it was his job to kind of catalog all the gods. Um, it's intriguing that he was asking who Yahweh is, but he obviously didn't respect him. And then this is his response, right? It, and it is apparent that he did really did care about this labor. He says, the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to work. Oh. Then 
Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. So yeah, Moses was right in his assessment that if he tried to manipulate Pharaoh by threatening to take away his slaves, like, yeah, you, this it seems like a, this is all that Pharaoh cares about. <clears throat> there you go. So this is, uh, this is what happens. The same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. We require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to the lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble and to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers. They had appointed the enemy. Why have you made your quota of bricks yesterday or today? Or before? And then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but their fault is with your own people. This is what Pharaoh said. Lazy, that's why you are lazy. This is why you keep saying, let us go sacrifice to Yahweh. Now, it's a work. You will not be given any straw yet. You must produce your full quota of bricks. Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told you were not to produce the number of bricks required you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May Yahweh look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials, and put a sword in their hands to kill us. So I'm just going to look through the responses of each character in this story. Um, Pharaoh, you know, asked that interesting question. Um, his job was to know the gods. He didn't know who Yahweh was, but uh, he basically disrespected him because he was supposed to be the conduit of the real gods, the Egyptian gods. Which that's something that we're going to get into uh, with the plagues. Uh, we'll be talking about it in the next few weeks. But it's interesting, Pharaoh's response. I think it's worth to, to ponder. Like, I don't think that would be a modern response. Who's Yahweh? Or, you know, what is this God that you're serving? I don't respect him. But yeah, that seems like that's the culture of the time. Uh, it's all about whose God is better, whose God is greater, or whose God's worth honoring. But noteworthy, verse 17, he remembers the name of Yahweh. He says, that's why you keep saying, I want to go worship Yahweh. So he obviously, you know, learning a little bit about who God is. You know, so <clears throat> I think it's very in interesting the Israelites' response. They call on Yahweh to judge Moses, which is ironic because Moses was sent by God to, to give this message to Pharaoh. So it seems clear that uh, the Israelites don't really have much understanding of who Yahweh is. They're pretty unaware. I mean, it makes sense. They've lived 400 years in Egypt. They probably have stories from 400 years ago of Joseph. We don't know of any story of Yahweh's dealings in that 400 years. So, I mean, imagine like, you know, our, our faith being based in something from 1600 and you just passed down in like an oral tradition. I mean, that's kind of like the world we live in now. We're, we're reading this book and from 4,000 years, this story from like 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, It'd be easy to, to kind of forget who God is. Um, and I think it's kind of funny, this language. I, I feel like God might have influenced what they said. You put a sword in their hands to kill us. You know, that's the same as the lie that Moses kind of threw into his threat to Pharaoh. Like, God will put us, you know, have them put us to the sword. So, yeah, it seems like maybe. Yahweh was kind of getting a message across to Moses through uh, the response from the Israelites. I feel like that happens to me sometimes too. Um, but 
Yeah. If you think back to the beginning of, of Exodus, when uh, Moses takes Yahweh's work into his own hands and tries to uh, enforce the justice and the killing of the Egyptian, when he goes and approaches the Hebrews, they say, you know, are you going to kill us too? It's kind of the same response, you know, you put the sword in their hand to kill us. You know, they're, it seems like the Israelites are very scared of getting killed. Uh, maybe because they were that killed. Yeah, so Moses did not do a great job. He took Yahweh's job into his own hands, trying to manipulate Pharaoh. Um, he ended up making things worse for the Hebrews. He ended up getting rejected by them. I'm sure he was feeling those exile feelings. Again, I guess the question is, will he go back to Midian and just get thrown in the towel and say, you know, um, I guess Yahweh, you know, doesn't want to do this. I, I can just go back to being a shepherd. But let's see what happens. Um, he returned to Yahweh and said, why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. It seems clear that, uh, yeah, he definitely felt this embarrassment. He felt lied to by God. He thought maybe, yeah, I was sent here to just be embarrassed. I was sent to just screw up again. Um, I, I think it's interesting, his statement at the end, ever since I went to Pharaoh, it, I mean, maybe it's been a while, but I mean, at least in the story of Exodus, it hasn't been that long. Um, so, I mean, maybe it's been weeks, maybe it's been months, maybe it's been a couple of days. It doesn't seem like he really remembers, uh, yeah, he doesn't remember at all what Yahweh promised, that Pharaoh was not going to respond positively, and that it was only going to take Yahweh stretching out his hand to get Pharaoh to let the people go. But he does remember Yahweh's promise to rescue his people. And he does call on God to come through on this promise. And if there's one thing you can do and you can bet on, you know, this is the power move. It's a call on God to come through on this promise. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, I think his response was okay. It was much better than the first one. Uh, not great. He complained a lot. He accused God of lying to him and deceiving him. But at least he complained to God instead of just running to, running to Midian. Keep going. So, <clears throat> yeah, it does not seem like Moses has grown a whole lot from this first experience. Seems like he's still wanting to take, you know, God's work into his own hands. He still has some serious problems, feeling like he fits into the Israelites, feeling like he, um, you know. He just has this temptation to just feel like rejected by them. And honestly, they, I mean, they do treat him pretty bad. Um, can't go to this one. Oh, he opted to Drake. He opted to take his complaints to Yahweh. Um, which I think is pretty good, honestly. Uh, I mean, that's, I think that's an important lesson I've learned in my life is, uh, if things are really bad, I just complain to God about it. It's a bit better than not complaining to God and just being stuck in bitterness. Even if what I say is not great, it's better than saying nothing. Yeah, go to the next one. So <clears throat> I would like you all to spend some time in reflection and speculation. I like to call it speculation because uh, I. I'm always hesitant to go beyond what the text says or to perform psychology, psych, psychology on like Bible characters um, and ask like, what if? But I also find it very rewarding and very helpful to just kind of take a pause in the middle of the story. Honestly, I could have flipped the page onto Exodus 6 and then gone into God's response. Uh, but I'm teaching next week, so I, I got to save that for next week. Um, 
But I think it's helpful to stop here and see, think about what Yahweh is up to. And uh, so you can either get in a group or just spend some time on your own. Um, I'm gonna give you guys like 10 to 15 minutes. And if you wanna share, depending on how you guys are feeling, I mean, I wasn't sure how many people were gonna be here today. Um, you guys can share what you think of these questions. Uh, the questions are, you know, knowing what you guys know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of Exodus, the whole thing. Um, what do you think would have happened if Pharaoh would have just let the Hebrews go right now? You know, if what Moses wanted happened, where he just it gives us gives the message, and then Pharaoh's like, okay. I think it has some serious implications for Moses' character, for the Israelites, and for Yahweh's reputation. I think uh, each of those play a part, and I think kind of get reveal maybe some of what Yahweh is up to. Um, so I think I don't know. I think that's something useful to discuss um, and break up. And I think at eleven forty, I'll just check in and pray. If you want to share? Eleven forty-five. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, groups of four or one. <laughs> <laughs>